Major General Perry Smith, former Director of Plans, United States Air Force, and CNN military analyst, spoke before the Council on December 11, 1991, at the Baltimore Grand. The title of the address is Lessons of the Gulf War and the Media Coverage. Introducing General Smith is Dr. Frank A. Byrd, President of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. General Smith is known to many of you, I know, from having been CNN's military analyst during those days a year ago, which are now so hard to remember, when most of us were transfixed uh, watching the developments in the Gulf. I suppose it's a common commentary on our era that something which was that significant, uh, that transfixing, and that important a historical lesson is almost lost to our memory as we watch other enormous historical events unfolding before our eyes. But we're delighted to have General Smith bring to us his expertise about the Gulf War and uh, about uh, the role of CNN in it. General Smith is a 1956 graduate of the Military Academy at West Point. He holds his PhD from Columbia University. His Ph.D. dissertation at Columbia received the distinct honor of being voted the outstanding dissertation in political science by the American Political Science Association and was subsequently published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Since then, he's authored four additional books. The latest is How CNN Fought the War. Uh, General Smith has taught at the Air Force Academy. Did I say fought the war? Okay, good. I'm always afraid I'm going to say won the war. And uh, someday I, I will say it, I'm sure. In any case, he taught at the Air Force Academy. He uh, had three tours of duty at the Pentagon, uh, wrote a book about that set of experiences, has written a book about uh, lessons of uh, leadership garnered from his uh, 30 years in the Air Force, and uh, has also, toward the end of his career, uh, served as chief of plans for the Air Force, uh, something which fascinates all of us who were amazed, I think, by the coordination of air power during the Gulf War, and was commandant of the uh, National War College. He uh, represents, I think, an interesting tradition in the military, that of the military intellectual. Uh, he has served uh, the nation well, and interestingly, he brings to us this evening uh, a set of unique experiences. He specializes now, I should add, in uh, what his company terms as visionary leadership, uh, strategic planning, and uh, questions of leadership and ethics. The topic tonight, as I said, is uh, the Gulf War, its lessons, and the role of the media in it. General Smith. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Uh, it's great to be with Frank. I've known Frank Bird for uh, almost 40 years, and when he called uh, a couple weeks ago and said I had to speak, I said, yes, sir, and so here I am. It's also great to be back in Baltimore. I've been in Baltimore many times. My uh, first recollection of Baltimore was when I was playing lacrosse for the United States Military Academy, and a uh, defenseman from Johns Hopkins decided to reconfigure my face. And uh, I went to the Johns Hopkins Hospital that night and had about uh, 10 stitches in, uh, in an eye that had been closed. And so uh, I uh, have seen uh, the lacrosse side of Baltimore. I've seen the Johns Hopkins University Hospital side of Baltimore. And now it's nice to be here with the Council on Foreign Affairs for Baltimore. The story I'm going to tell is, uh, is really in two dimensions. One is I'm going to, first of all, talk a little bit about the CNN experience and the insights I gained from, the, from working for CNN. And the second thing I'm going to do is talk mostly about the military lessons that came out of the, Vietnam, uh, out of the uh, Gulf War. We'll open it up for questions, and uh, I'll be happy to stay as long as you want. After the session, I'll be happy to, to autograph books in the back, and uh, we're selling them at discount tonight uh, in honor of Frank, and I'll be happy to do that until such time as I have to leave. Uh, first, let me talk about CNN. The CNN experience was interesting for me because I was not the first choice to be the air analytical fellow for CNN. They wanted Mike Dugan, 
who had been the chief of staff of the Air Force, who had been fired by Dick Cheney in September of 1990 for giving away a lot of secrets about how we might conduct the air campaign. But when Mike Dugan turned them down, uh, he, uh, Tom Johnson, the president of CNN, said, well, who would you recommend? And uh, Mike said, well, why don't you grab Perry Smith? And so they grabbed Perry Smith at the very last second, and I did not come to work for CNN until the night the war broke, broke out. So those of you who are, who are awake until after midnight saw me for the first time at 17 minutes after midnight the night the war broke out. I drove from my home in Augusta, Georgia, over to Atlanta, and halfway on the way, I realized I didn't know anything. And I was about ready to be on national and international television, so I made a good decision. I pulled into a gas station, and I called a colonel in the Pentagon named John Warden, who had written a book a couple of years before called The Air Campaign, and who was the man who was the architect for the air campaign for the Gulf War, and I called him up and I said, John, I know you're terribly busy, but give me what's going on. Don't tell me any secrets, but give me at least an outline of what's happening because I'm going to do a lot of television commentary and I haven't had time to do any research because I got hired at the last minute. He gave me about a 30-minute rundown. I drove the last hour to Atlanta talking to myself, asking myself questions and then answering the questions because I knew when I got to Atlanta, I would have no time. And in fact, when I got to the studio, they put some powder on the top of my head for obvious reasons. And I was off and running with commentary. And for the next six weeks, I, I, was on the, I, w I worked about 18 hours a day. I would get to work at 6 in the morning and work till about midnight. And I was on as many as eight times a day, including times at 3 o'clock in the morning. And the first time they asked me to be on at 3 o'clock in the morning, I asked them, I said, how many people will be watching me at 3 o'clock in the morning? About a dozen? And they said, no, probably about 20 million. And I said, well, where are they going to be? You know, nobody's going to stay up that late. And they said, no, they're going to be watching you in Japan, in Singapore, in Australia, in India, in Indonesia. And it came clear to me fairly quickly that CNN was reaching a very large audience. It turns out that there were a billion people watching CNN in 108 nations. Uh, I think CNN did a good job in a number of dimensions, and I think they did a poor job in a, no a number of other dimensions. But let me give you what I think uh, are probably the dozen uh, areas which are really interesting to people interested in how operations work in a very intense environment. I do a lot of teaching on leadership in various settings around the country, and uh, it was interesting for me to be just a worker in an organization like this and look at it from a leadership perspective. The first thing that came to me again about the second day of the war was when I went into an executive producer with an idea on something that might go on the, on the air. I said, nobody's cover covering this part of the story and it's very important. Uh, he listened to me for about a minute, asked a couple of questions. I figured that he would talk about it, check with his bosses, have three meetings, and maybe we'd do it tomorrow. And he said to me after about a minute and a half, he says, you're right, we're going to wipe out the next two stories. You're on in a minute and 45 seconds. <laughs> and that's the way they make decisions at CNN. And it's very interesting because they empower their producers. The producers of CNN are the ones that have power in the production booth where they have all the stories all coming in by satellite, and they're the ones that decide. It's best to have the producers decide because they can see all the things that are available. Many networks have anchors who make decisions, and that's the worst person to make a decision because the anchor is caught by the camera and can't figure out what's really going on behind the camera or in the executive suite, and neither place is a good place to make decisions in a fast-breaking kind of situation. So they empower the right people, and that are the, uh, those are the producers. The second area where I think they do well is in the area of strategic planning. The reason that CNN had the uh, coverage it had during the war is it planned very well for this war. It got the satellites lined up, it had the technology lined up, it had backup systems lined up, it had the permissions pretty well in line, and therefore was able to give coverage from many locations throughout the war. The receptivity to innovation. Anybody at CNN Atlanta or anybody at CNN pra practically anywhere in the world with, with an idea, all they had to do was talk to a producer. If it was a good idea, we we're going to be on the air with it. When you have to produce news 24 hours a day forever, 
There are lots of opportunities for ideas to turn into stories to get on camera. And that was a big advantage that CNN had over the other networks is there was lots of time to do things and lots of receptivity to innovation. Uh, electronic mail, fascinating system they have at CNN. Everybody is linked into a computer mail system and they very seldom had any meetings during the war. People found out what was going on by looking at a computer on their desk or wherever they were and they got uh, directions from their bosses, they got news stories coming in, the producers even had uh, computers in their homes tied into these uh, computer networks and so they would do that at home and so when they arrived at the studio they knew what was going on the, day, the moment they walked in the door. Electronic mail system is another thing that was interesting. The velocity of decision making I've talked about. The use of military analysts. CNN used over 60 Six zero sixty military analysts during the war. James Blackwell and I were full-time military analysts. He was covering the ground side, I covered the air side. But they brought in all kinds of other people with various backgrounds to try to flesh out the story and make the story as, uh, as complete as possible. The creative use of technology, the four-wire system that allowed them and no other network to broadcast that first night. A four-wire system allows you to have independent uh, communication back to Atlanta, and that worked very well. The, uh, the flyaway uplink uh, uh, capability for the TV, the satellite redundancy, they use technology very well. Recently, I was down at Fort Meade talking to the head of the National Security Agency, and he is using CNN as a model to develop a system for the intelligence community of the United States military to do the kind of quick analysis and quick study that CNN has, has done. The booking system, they have 13 full-time bookers at CNN, not hookers, but bookers, okay? These bookers basically look out all over the world to find the best expert on whatever subject is uh, to be debated and try to bring them in and use those, uh, those uh, people. They research them very carefully, including a very careful computer search at night, and if they find a phony or somebody who is not what he or she says they are, they get disinvited the next morning before they appear on the air and how carefully they book their guests is very interesting. They have a Rolodex with 40,000 names on it of experts of every dimension, and they're constantly bringing that Rolodex up to date day by day as the, uh, as the news breaks. The design of the Atlanta facility. If you have a chance to go to Atlanta, take the CNN tour because you see a facility specifically designed to handle 24-hour news and particularly fast-breaking crisis kinds of situations. So that's a, a, a strong thing. And the willingness to admit error. CNN made hundreds of mistakes during the war, but they were willing in most cases to acknowledge the mistakes that they made and correct the mistake quickly on the air. I made a number of mistakes, would go to a producer and say, I just made a mistake on the air. And many times I was back on within 30 minutes correcting the error that I had made so that the people who were watching got, got the right information rather than the wrong information. There are too many organizations in this country who are unwilling to admit that they make mistakes. CNN is willing to do that and make corrections. Now, they made a lot of mistakes, and, and I think it's in, appropriate to mention those. First of all, what I call breathless journalism. Stuff was coming in by satellite, usually tape, but also a lot of live stuff, and I was often asked to narrate without giving, giving any chance to look at the tape not even five minutes to look at the tape. And I'd say, wait a minute, I need five minutes to see what this tape is about. And they'd say, you don't have five minutes, get on the air and narrate on the fly. And I don't think that was really responsible on their part. I should have resisted that because uh, if you have that big an audience out there hanging on every word that you say, it's very useful to know what you're talking about. And I thought in many cases we could have done a better job if they'd given me five or 10 minutes to see what the tape was to make sure I knew what it was so I could narrate it more correctly. So breathless journalism is a problem that CNN has. I had major problems with uh, Peter Arnett's coverage of the war, largely because I thought for a time he became a propaganda vehicle for Saddam Hussein and made a number of statements that were just plain wrong or false. And I thought there were a number of times where he shouldn't have gone on the air because what he had to say was so far from the truth, and I had some problems with that. And one day on an ethical issue on the 7th of February, I almost left CNN 
uh, because of the fact that they were reporting things I thought were way off base. So I did have some problems with it, but overall I was impressed by their organization. Uh, Ted Turner had the vision for 24-hour news. He turned it over to some very good managers in Tom Johnson, who's the president, and Ed Turner, no relation to Ted, who's the executive vice president, and they run an operation which I was very comfortable with in general. Good people, solid people, middle of the road people without a heavy ideological bias one way or the other, and people I had a uh, uh, good time working with. And the final thing, I guess, about CNN was the use of military analysts. The big advantage that James Blackwell and I had on CNN is we had a lot of air time. They gave us a lot of time to answer questions and get into depth on issues. Where the other networks, because of time constraints, oftentimes would only give, say, a Mike Dugan or, or a Mick Trainer only two minutes, I would often get four or five or six or seven minutes to explain an issue. And that allowed me to get into the this, this subject in greater detail. So I think the fact that they gave us a lot of air time and used us a lot was helpful and allowed us to give coverage a little bit more in depth than the other networks. Now, what, uh, uh, what about the lessons in the Gulf War itself from a military perspective? Because I want to leave CNN, although that's an interesting story, and I would welcome questions that you might have about CNN. I think it is useful to look at uh, the military lessons of the war. First, I think, and maybe foremost, is the empowerment of the field commander. It goes back to kind of World War II days where the commander in the field had the authority to make the tactical decisions and the operational decisions and he was not micromanaged by the Pentagon. During the Vietnam War, Robert McNamara pretty well micromanaged the Vietnam War where in this war Cheney and Powell empowered Schwarzkopf and helped him run the war but did not direct him in the running of the war. And I think that was a good way to operate. We were very fortunate to have a very strong commander in Schwarzkopf. And by the way, I, I saw Schwarzkopf today in the Atlanta airport, uh, and uh, I had not seen him since the war, and uh, had a chance to, to chat with him a bit about his experience. I think we were very fortunate to have a field commander who enjoyed having the authority to decide and decided well. The second thing is what I call the paradigm of precision. We have now developed within the military the capability to hit targets very precisely. Now, only 10% of our weapons in this Gulf War were precision weapons, and 90% were non-precision weapons, but we have validated the fact that we have the capability to be very accurate, and that's very useful capability to have, and we'll see more precision in the future. And that paradigm is well established. I think the next big step in the area of technological development in the military will be what I call the non-lethal destruction of targets. We're in a war 10 or 15 or 20 years in the future we might be engaged in. We ought to be able to take out a tank or take out the computer in the tank or the ignition system in the tank without using lethal weaponry. And that is the, that's the technique that will be the follow-on to the paradigm of precision. But that worked well. Another one was a sustained commitment to honest reporting. Schwarzkopf did not cook the numbers, overemphasize his, uh, his results as happened during part of the Vietnam War. And that was very good because it revalidated the fact that the United States military is an institution of high integrity and believes fundamentally in reporting accurately uh, uh, its results during that period of time. And that, I think, was very helpful. Uh, another area, I think, is unity of command on the air side. In the Vietnam War, we actually had three different air commanders. Uh, in this war, we had a single air commander with all the military forces, all the air forces of all the various services in all the nations working for a single air commander. We had 110,000 sorties, or individual flights, and we didn't have one mid-air collision during combat. Now, that is an extraordinary performance when you realize that those airplanes were milling around a lot at night and in bad weather, that we didn't have airplanes running together. The only mid-air collision we had was on a tanker. An airplane hit a tanker and one airplane was lost, but that was away from the combat environment. So the unity of command, a single operational off, uh, operations officer, off order, and the fact that we had controlling elements in uh, AWACS-type airplanes with radars, the, the de-conflict airplanes, was a major step forward in air combat, and I think that was useful. The creative use of deception planning, uh, Schwarzkopf deceived the enemy with his great end run operation and did not use the amphibious operation. And I think that was one of the reasons that that ground campaign went well, 
deception planning is a, is a part of, uh, of uh, strategy, and I think he did that well. The use of tactical innovation. We did a number of things militarily in this war that we had not planned to do when the war first broke up, out. But a lot of bright people saw better ways to do things, and there are a number of things that we did early on in the war that we hadn't planned to do that worked out well. Uh, example, uh, for instance, uh, would be uh, going after the Scud launchers. We actually put airplanes in orbit, and we used the satellite capability to watch these Scuds come up. We saw the Scuds by their heat, got the message to the F-15s in orbit, and were able to go after the launchers within three or four minutes after they launched. Even though it was at night, we normally could find them, so slowly we diminished that Scud capability. Uh, we also learned that the best way to avoid uh, combat casualties was to keep our airplanes high, and most of the deliveries were done by deliveries from high altitude, and we stayed out of that uh, ground fire, and that's why our losses were so low. Uh, Schwarzkopf did a nice job of pulling a delicate coalition together and holding it together. A lot of people in the post-war period have said that was easy. He was an easy enemy, and it was an easy enemy to defeat, and it was an easy coalition to hold together. I think that, that that's not true. I think Schwarzkopf made it look easy, but it was a difficult task and done particularly well. Another more broad lesson that comes out of the war, I think, is the United Nations. The United Nations, as it was designed in 1944-45, worked really for the first time where a number of resolutions that went through the uh, Security Council were validated and used in the war. We had a coalition that worked and operated well under those uh, UN mandates. And in the post-war period, even though there's an agony of Saddam Hussein still being there, the United Nations now has validated the, their responsibility and authority to go into an independent sovereign country when that sovereign country is doing something out of bounds and look very carefully at what it's doing. So the validation of the UN in a number of dimensions, it seems to me, is one of the uh, useful lessons that comes out, come out of, uh, out of the war. Where are we today? In a very, very sad situation with Saddam Hussein still in power, but as far as the military is concerned, if I can return to that, the United States military then ha now has validated itself as the most competent military in the world, uh, with high self-esteem, and that's helpful because the esteem of the military in the aftermath of the Vietnam War was not good, did not have good self-esteem, nor did the country have high esteem for it. The good assimilation of technology, the military assimilated technology well, despite a lot of press and congressional uh, criticism. During the early 80s, I was the Air Force planner, and I, had to, I was beat up a lot on Capitol Hill for what we were doing in technology when in fact most of the technology was well worth doing and worked very well during the war. We also, the military also developed very good training programs, particularly in the late 70s and early 80s, to make training more realistic and make training more fun. And there's some very interesting lessons that can be learned from the military experience of coming out of the doldrums to a very competent uh, capability by the by the late 80s and early 90s that the business community can learn. And one is make training really realistic and make training fun. And that, I think, is, is good. And so having a competent military in the background in any diplomatic uh, activity in the years ahead will be very helpful. The big challenge, it seems to me, for the future is as we reduce the military very dramatically over the next 10 years, it very likely could be half the size by the year 2000 it is today that we do it in a way that makes sense, that we have a robust military at the end, even though a much smaller military, uh, so that that military can provide all the services that it provides this nation and has for, for, for many, many years. And finally, the United States established, it seems to me, or reestablished, its very strong, what I call alliance potential, the ability to bring des disparate groups together and nations together in a common cause was reestablished for the United States, and that I think serves us very, very well indeed. So there are a lot of lessons both on the media side and on the military side. I've covered those, and I think what I'd like to do now is stop and open it up for questions, because there are, there are many other issues, but I want to have plenty of time for questions, so please do so. I will repeat the question for the, for the camera, I guess, uh, and so uh, I'd be happy to entertain questions now, please. Can you comment on close air support, close in support? Yes. 
And also, can you comment on the use of the Maverick, the infrared Maverick, in a close-in support? Yes. And also, can you comment on the use of Lantern? As you know, Lantern, the first word in Lantern is low, yes. not high. Yes. Can you please uh, comment on the use of the Lantern pod from 20,000 feet or 30,000 yes. feet? Uh, the, the first question relates to close air support, which uh, basically, of course, is the close support of of troops in combat by air, whether the air be uh, Air Force air, Navy air, Marine air, or Army air, trying to support uh, people in close contact with the troops. In general terms, the close air support uh, worked well. There was good coordination, there was good radio contact, uh, there, was, there was a lot of good support. There were a number of cases, however, of, uh, of friendly fire casualties and people killed both Americans and from other nations where in fact the uh, airplane or the uh, Apache helicopter or whatever it was in fact killed uh, uh, troops. So I guess the lesson there is if you're going to fight a lot and particularly at night, we fought a lot more close air support at night than we ever had before, that we've got to develop better procedures and better technologies to be, be able to differentiate between a friendly tank and a non-friendly tank. We had some systems there, but they weren't on many of the vehicles. There will be a lot of work to be done in that area to ensure that close air support in the future will be safer for our friendly forces. But in general terms, it worked well. As far as the Maverick missile was concerned, the Maverick missile worked well, but we found that we could destroy tanks with a much cheaper, uh, in a much cheaper kind of a way, and that was the use of laser-guided 500-pound bombs which only cost uh, maybe a third the cost of a Maverick missile. And so we moved off of Mavericks and used a lot of, uh, of individual bombs going against tanks later on in the, uh, in, in the, in the combat uh, period. And as far as Lantern is concerned, I don't have any inside uh, knowledge on the use of Lantern. I, I, I haven't investigated that, so I don't have an answer to that question. Yes, please. If, if you would go to the mic, it's much better, I think. Please. Go ahead, sir. I wonder if you could comment on the pre-war reports of the Iraqi army and how distorted and how exaggerated it seemed to be and whether there was a serious breakdown in the intelligence that we got prior to the war. Yes. Uh, the, the question related to the pre-war analysis of the Iraqi army in which there may have been some inflated uh, concerns about its capability. Uh, if you look closely at that, you'll find that there were reports on both sides. There was an Army War College study that came out about six months before the war that basically showed that the Iraqi Army had, in fact, some very serious problems as far as morale and training in other areas. So there wasn't a universal feeling. However, the Iraqi Army had fought the Iranians for eight years, had had some combat success, particularly in the last year or so of the Iran-Iraq War, had recruited a lot more soldiers, was a large army and with about a million strong. Uh, and so consequently, it did look like it had some fairly significant capability. What we didn't see before the war clearly was how vulnerable it was to air power and how unprepared it was for a sustained air campaign, which went on for that first 38 days. We underestimated their, uh, or we overestimated their capability to deal with the air threat. They camouflage themselves very well, for instance, against ground forces, but camouflage themselves very poorly against air forces. So what I think we did was we did an analysis of the Iraqi army based on its Iran experience and the fact that it was quite good and professional in ground campaigns and under or overstressed its capability to deal with air campaign. I guess I'd like to ask, why were we so off base? If we've got such a wonderful analysis of enemies and so yes. forth, why couldn't we have been more accurately able to assess that? That's a very fair question. I think the general tendency in the intelligence community is, when in doubt, be absolutely sure you don't understate the threat. And we did that kind of historically during the Vietnam War. We did not see the Vietnam, North Vietnamese nor the Viet Cong as that serious a problem, and they turned out to be a very serious problem. So as a result, there is a tendency, was a tendency, and we've got to be careful about this, to overstate the threat, and there was clearly some of that there. So one of the lessons is, let's look very tough, both sides relating to a military force, in all dimensions of that military force. For instance, we knew and acknowledged that their air power wasn't much, 
and don't overstate the problem. On the other hand, you've got to realize that Schwarzkopf had a military force much smaller, much smaller than the Iraqi army. And so consequently, he wanted to be absolutely sure that he had the air power and the, and the top, uh, uh, top flight soldiers to be able to handle that, that campaign. We beat a much larger army with a very uh, uh, skillful uh, set of strategy and tactics. But I think your point is well made. You've got to be careful not to either under, understate or overstate the threat. Yes, please. I, I, I think my question somewhat overlaps the question that was just asked. Yes. We sent in many, many soldiers yes. almost on the spur of the moment. Did those who made that decision think ahead of time, plan ahead of time, what they were going to run into, including this vital question of what to do with uh, Hussein once we had won the war? It seems as though the questions yes. were settled after the soldiers were there. Yes, I think if you, look at the, if you look at the campaign that Schwarzkopf put together from a military dimension, he was given a specific task. He was given a specific task. The que if you look at that specific task, what he was asked to do, it seems to me the strategy and tactics that he devised to do that job were first rate. I think the more important question, which is the thrust of your question, is what about other contingencies like what if Saddam Hussein stays in power? Why didn't we plan for that? Why didn't we do contingency planning for the possibility of a major Kurdish refugee problem and, and, uh, and civil war and all that? I think we did a poor job of, of what I would call planning for the post-war world and doing a number of scenarios for a various uh, post-war situations and be able to have at least some preliminary planning done to deal with we, each one of those. That's what strategic planning is all about, not looking at the most likely future or the happiest future, which would be Saddam Hussein being thrown out by his own people, but looking at other alternatives and having contingency plans to deal with that. In that area, I think our government fell badly down. The, the military uh, can deserve part of the blame for that, but that's a bigger problem. That's a White House and State Department problem as well as just a, a, a Secretary of Defense problem. Yes, sir. In the year 2000, you said our military may be half of what it is now. Do you think we would be able to address a comparable threat in the year 2000 as we faced with Iraq? Yeah, if we have a military uh, half the size of what it is now by the year 2000, and if we were able to pull coalitions together the way we did in this particular uh, situation, then I think we can and would be able to deal with contingencies similar to the Iraqi situation. If, however, we take the military below half of what it is now, in other words, from a million active, two million active duty forces to a million, there are people now talking about a military force of a quarter of the size of it is now, then I don't think we'll be able to do it. So I think the, 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 the force of a million active duty forces and perhaps 400,000 reserve and guard forces is what I would call a minimal size force to do the things that our military will be called to do uh, in the 21st century. But I think we'll probably go down to about that level. I hope we don't go below that. But yes, they could do that. But again, it would be contingent on coalition partners supporting us in the effort, not only providing bases, but also providing soldiers and airplanes. And, and if we couldn't do that, then no, I don't think we could do that with a million person force. Yes, sir. My comment is the same, uh, along the same lines. You didn't talk about the the integration of the reserve and the National Guard and their effectiveness with the regulars. Yes. And with the downsizing of the military, it really worries me very much today that we might say, oh, well, we can win any war and we're cut out the, the Guard and the reserves and, yes. and the rest of it. Uh, the question related to the Guard and reserves and the integration of the Guard and reserve during the war, prior to the war, and the future as far as the Guard and reserve are, are, are concerned. The Guard and Reserves did a splendid job in many dimensions. First of all, they, when they were called, they came. And they didn't protest, and they came uh, uh, with a lot of professionalism. The Air Guard, for instance, not only came, but flew a lot of combat missions. Uh, the Air Reserves didn't fly many combat missions, but they flew a lot of, a uh, uh, a lot of support missions. So the Reserves and the Guard did well. Now, the Army National Guard did have some problems. And there were some army, what they call roundout brigades, that when they looked at them closely, were not combat ready. 
and therefore were not sent to Saudi Arabia. And so that's an issue that will need to be addressed, and that is, can you expect an Army combat unit from the Reserve or the Guard with only 39 days of training a year to be fully able to go into war within, you know, a month or two after activation? That question, it seems to me, will have to be and is being readdressed, and that will be readdressed. As far as the future is concerned, there's a big debate going on in the Secretary of Defense's office and in the military services is, are as how large the reserve will be and the guard will be in the future, and will they be reduced at the same proportion to the active duty, or will they be reduced more or less than the active duty forces? Right now, they're going to be reduced in planning in almost direct proportion to the reduction of the active duty forces, the reserve and guard forces will be re reduced. Now, I just uh, talked to all the Air Guard leaders in Nashville a couple of weeks ago, and there's a strong feeling within the Air Guard community, the Air, Air National Guard, that the Air Guard does not need to be re reduced proportionately because they are so capable, they ought to be able to, to stay fairly robust even as the active duty uh, forces reduce. So there'll be a very important debate in the future but I think what is really clear is, if you're gonna have guard and reserve forces, you have to have them well trained, you gotta give them good equipment. They may be smaller, but they have to be ready to go on active duty quickly and serve quickly. And that, it seems to me, is the lesson of the Gulf War. Yes, please. Uh, will you comment on the logistics support, both the airlift and sea lift uh, during the Iraqi war? Yeah. And also, uh, would you uh, speculate on what lessons we might learn from that war for future third world conflict? as far as uh, logistics support is concerned? Yes. Uh, the question related to logistics support in the Gulf War and then in the future and how it, it might play out. As far as logistics support for the Gulf War, it was excellent largely because there had been a lot of good planning ahead of time on logistics support. We had bought some fast sea lift and, uh, and quite a few airlift airplanes, and we had time. We had from the 2nd of August, 1990, until the 16th of January, 1991, to get all those forces over there. Uh, but they did a good job and they were very well led. And in fact, we had more supplies on hand to support our forces over there after the war cranked up than when the war started. And we didn't run out of bombs and we didn't run out of parts. It was a, it was a brilliant logistics performance during the war, especially considering how far it was away. There are, however, serious deficiencies. We don't have enough sea lift, particularly enough fast sea lift. And we had to borrow and beg everything we could get to get that sea lift. So there's still a, a serious deficiency in sea lift. And as more and more of our forces leave Europe and leave Asia and come back to the United States, the next deployment will be harder because many of the forces came out of Europe to Saudi Arabia rather than all the way from the States. So there'll be a need to uh, continue to support uh, lift. Airlift is in pretty good shape. Uh, sea lift needs more help, and I think that will be uh, the area of emphasis in the years ahead. The, I'm not sure I got the last part of your question. The lessons learned from the logistics support operations uh, and how they might apply to uh, other third world conflicts. Uh, we were lucky to have all that fuel over there in yeah. Saudi Arabia at well, our the, disposal. Yeah, the, the lessons, it seems to me, are, are first of all, we were very lucky because we had a lot of fuel over there, but also the Saudi bases were very robust and they had a lot of equipment over there. We had pre-positioned a lot of stuff in uh, uh, Diego Garcia. So as we see potential problems in the future, we have to think about pre-positioning material forward so that if we do go into a contingency, we, won't, we, don't, we don't have to ship everything from the, uh, from the state. So pre-positioning of equipment forward, even though we may bring many of our forces home, is a, is a very clear lesson out of this war. Another aspect, of course, is to try to make as much as possible the logistics as light and as easy to move as possible. And a lot of the equipment we sent over there, we're miniaturizing a lot of our equipment, and we can do that more so we will not have to lift as much in the future as we will in the past. So that's another lesson from the logistic, uh, logistics side. But you don't win wars without good logistics planning way ahead of time and without good logistics execution, but I think the lesson was that was done well in both dimensions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You are still speaking in terms of spectacular hardware, but from what I heard the other day, it's going to be easier for potential enemies to prepare genetic attacks, not so that it wouldn't be tanks, it would be the personnel in the tanks 
that would be weeping for 12 hours or suffering from major uh, vomiting problems and so on. Not only that, the genetic damage to civilian populations. Yep. What kind of health pr preparations is the Army going to have to take care of this kind of damage? Well, that's a very fair question, and I think uh, I'm not, I don't have a very good answer for it, other than to say that the, the one nice thing about the military today is they are very good about strategic planning and looking deep into the future as to what the threat patterns might be as far as nations, as far as weapon systems, as far as new technologies, and all that. And so consequently, DOD, as opposed to many other agencies in our government, does do and has got a very professional group of people who look at those kinds of dimensions and try to figure out ways to offset that, to deter, deter that kind of activity from taking, and to deal with it when, it when it takes place. I don't have a specific answer to your question because I'm not keeping up with that dimensions of the technology, but it's a fair point. I talk to the planners all the time, and I'll try to check out what they're doing in this area, but my guess is they are doing some planning in that area. Yes, please. Why were the civilian targets such as power plants, water, and sewage hit so early when the pinpoint munitions could have focused it uh, maybe exclusively on military, at least for the initial phase, if not the whole time? I think the, uh, the, the idea of going after the bridges, the power plants, uh, the communications business was to try to paralyze the command and control and logistics support uh, element of the Iraqi military so that when the ground campaign in fact took place, that military could not communicate, could not provide logistics support to the Kuwaiti theater of operations. Uh, you take out bridges so that the tanks and trucks can't get across the bridges to go resupply. You take out electrical power uh, uh, plants in order to ensure that the electric <coughs> support for communications facilities is broken down. So it's those targets have a military dimension and since we had lots of ordnance and we had lots of airplanes we could simultaneously go after the military targets pure military targets while going after targets that had both a military and civilian component at the same time and if we're going to wipe wrap this war up in in quick time and the original plan by the way was to have the war over in 30 days you had to hit both sets of targets almost on the first day to ensure that would take place yes sir I have a three-part question about the B-1 bomber. Uh, number one, what, what did it cost to build the thing? Yes. Secondly, uh, what's your opinion of the plane? Should it have really been built? And thirdly, uh, why wasn't it used in a war? Was it because it was unsuitable for that war or it was unreliable or what? Yeah. Uh, three-part question on the B-1 bomber, which is the most modern of our operational bombers. How much does it, uh, did it cost? The total cost of the program uh, was in the neighborhood of, as I recall, 26 or 28 billion dollars. In general, in general terms, the airplane costs maybe a couple of hundred million dollars each when you count all the support equipment and all the uh, training base and logistics and all that business. We only built a hundred of those bombers. The bomber has been a disappointment in a number of dimensions in the sense that it uh, has had electronic problems. It hasn't had the full operational capability that we had hoped to have. And it didn't get into the war because it was designed primarily to have a nuclear capability, both gravity bombs and cruise missiles. And the conventional capability was secondary because we still had plenty of B-52s and therefore we had not validated the bombs to fall off the B-1s. And a fourth reason, I guess, or a second reason for not using it is we really didn't need it and, uh, because we had so much capability over there. But in general terms, I think that the B-1 was, in fact, and has been, in fact, a bit of a disappointment for this country and for this nation in the sense that it has not met expectations in a number of dimensions. It still has a very useful deterrent value as long as we have uh, countries with nuclear uh, capability against us, although that's a diminishing problem. And I think the B-1 bomber will stay around for a while, but I doubt very seriously uh, if it will fully develop a conventional capability. And I think over time we'll begin to see it moving out of the inventory, but not until things settle down, particularly in what's left of the Soviet Union. Yes, sir. You'll enjoy this one. I have a, a Peter Arnett uh, question for you. Okay. Colonel Harry Summers wrote a column recently in which he pointed out that earlier on he had identified Arnett as a traitor 
but having heard him speak at a press banquet, he now realized that what he was guilty of was not treason, but toadyism, toadying to Ted Turner. A uh, two-part question for you. Do you see Arnett as a traitor or a toady? And if he's a toady, does that make Ted Turner uh, a traitor? <laughs> wow. Uh, the, the question uh, was uh, the, uh, the two-part question on Peter Arnett, where he's been accused of being a, tra a traitor, and a recent column said he wasn't really a traitor, he was a toady to Ted Turner, and does that make Ted Turner a traitor? Uh, my feeling, Ar Arnett, uh, is I'm quite critical of Arnett, but I've tried very hard in my book to be fair to him. He was over there by himself. He was in a combat environment. There were bombs falling and missiles coming across. Uh, and he was very much constrained by the censorship rules of, uh, of the Iraqis, and yet he wanted to continue to report on a daily basis. My criticism of Arnett is not that he was either a traitor or a toady, although there may have been a little bit of each. My feeling about uh, Arnett was he was a sloppy and lazy journalist. And let me give you some specific examples. When Arnett would interview somebody like Saddam Hussein or, or, or Ramsey Clark, he would nod his head. If you are a television journalist and you are interviewing somebody, particularly on controversial issues, you should not show any indication whether you agree or disagree with the individual. Peter Arnett had been a print journalist for a long time, but now he is a television journalist and he should not do that. And he sent signals to a lot of people that in fact he was agreeing with Saddam Hussein. I don't think he was agreeing with what he was saying, but he was giving that indication, and that's sloppy journalism. The second area was there were times when the Iraqis so censored what he had to say that what he had to say, what was left on his script, was so far from the truth that I think that he should not have reported that day. He should have just said, I have nothing to say this day, I'll check with you tomorrow. But he continued to report and CNN run, ran his reports throughout the day and I don't think that was responsible journalism on his part. I do feel that he should have been there. But I don't think he should win all the awards that he's winning. I think the person who did the best job was Christiane Amanpour, who came in a little later in the war, who was also from CNN, who asked the tough questions and fought that censorship hard and reported much more accurately. If there is a person who should win the journalistic awards, it's either, uh, it's either Sadler of ITN, who did a pretty nice job, or maybe best of all, it is Christiana Mompour of CNN, who I think ought to win the journalistic awards for being there and yet staying faithful to the truth and fighting hard against the censorship. Yes, sir. Drawing upon your experiences as a career military officer as, <clears throat> as well as your uh, perspective as a journalist for CNN, could you comment on many members of the media, their criticism of uh, the way information is, is managed or, or doled out to the media in times of war, such as Grenada, Panama, or the, uh, the Gulf War. And then as a follow-up to that, um, do you believe that the American public uh, via the media were intentionally misled by the, uh, uh, those managing the Gulf campaign? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the question relates to uh, the media coverage of the war, the, the Pentagon manipulating the media, withholding information from the media, uh, in that general dimension. There has been a lot of criticism of the military and how they presented the uh, news on the war. They gave a lot of briefings, they gave a lot of information out, they certainly gave a lot of information to me and I was able to use it. I talked to the Pentagon probably 30 times a day and so they used me as an intermediary to, to get the news out. And so I think in fairness to the military, I think they tried very hard to present a lot of information. On the other hand, I think the journalists do have a point and that is there were, there were stories that easily could have been reported that were either uh, held up or not allowed to be used by the military. In many cases where the military had made some kind of an error and it wasn't a secret but it was an error and so they steered them away from the story. So there was in fact uh, a number of cases particularly during the ground war where the journalist had a legitimate complaint about the fact that the military was not as forthcoming in providing them opportunities to present the story in real time to people who really wanted to do it. It was a delicate situation of the military because they didn't want to help Saddam Hussein. They want to minimize casualties on both sides, but some, in some cases they, they clearly withheld too much information. 
I do not, however, agree with the comment that Ted Turner made recently on David Frost that the United States military uh, per, uh, censored the news just as much as Saddam Hussein. I think that's a ridiculous statement. I think the United States military did a much better job of preventing the news, but I think could do better, and I think that's one of the things that needs to be examined very carefully. How much more could the military have done? How much more forthcoming could they have been to 1,600 newsmen from all over the world? And I think there are areas where there could be improvement, but I think they tried to do a good job, and in general terms, I think they did, did do a good job, at least from my perspective. Yes, sir. Would you please comment on the uh, Kurdish situation and their right, as far as we see it, I think pretty generally, of being ignored in our pursuit of justice uh, for all participants in the war? Number one, that's question number one. Question number two, if you have time, uh, what is your opinion of the CIA's performance before the war? Okay, uh, the first question relates to the Kurdish situation. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, would you rephrase that because I wasn't sure of the thrust of that question. The fact that the Kurds seem to be pushed aside and their need for real aid and position taking, perhaps for their ethnic integrity and so yes. forth. That the Kurds were pushed aside and the need for their ethnic integrity. I think we handled the Kurdish situation very poorly in the sense that we didn't anticipate the problem very well. We didn't have contingency plans lined up to do something about the situation. The only area I would guess I would say we did pretty well is once we realized a week or 10 days into that desperate situation, we did move fairly quickly. But that should have been something we should have anticipated. I also think we gave expectations to the Kurds that we weren't willing to fulfill, much like we did the Hungarians in 56. And we, as, a, as the major player in world politics, have to be very careful not to give expectations to nations or subnational groups unless we're fairly uh, clear that we're going to be able to support those expectations. So in that area, I think it was, it was a pretty poor job. And even today, I think, uh, we have strung the Kurds out. And I think we could have done better. I think we can do better. Now, as far as the C how the CIA did before the war, the CIA, of course, doesn't have spies on the inner sanctum of Saddam's military. And whenever they don't have agents buried within the Ba'athist Party or buried within the Iraqi military to report to us, they have to rely largely on technical means, satellite, signals, intelligence, and so forth. In some areas, they did very well, particularly as far as the tactical side of the, uh, of, of the battlefield and how the battlefield was and where the forces were. On the side where the Iraqis had highly compartmentalized stuff, for instance, in their nuclear program, they didn't do very well at all because the Iraqis were not talking on the radio about that program. Everything was hardwired, and they weren't doing that. And so in that area, I think we very seriously erred in how their capability was. So it's like almost always when you deal with intelligence agencies, it's a mixed bag. In that particular area, they did a poor job. But again, any nation where you don't have spies internal and who decides they're going to really hide something, and have a lot of territory to do it, has a pretty good chance of doing it. What it has done is it's wakened us up to the fact that there are many nations much farther along in developing of nuclear weapons than we had anticipated. So that's been a, a wake-up call. But before the war, we didn't do a good job. Yes, please. Did we learn any lessons about the Soviet Union uh, because of their support of Saddam Hussein, the training of the Army? And uh, what lessons did we learn about Russian military uh, equipment uh, as a result of this? And would you comment about yeah. whether you think the Russian military is going to stand still for everything that's going on today in Russia? Okay, in the that's Soviet a Union. Yes, the question relates to the mili uh, Russian military, their training in the I Iraqi, and how the Russian military is going to operate in, the, in this very chaotic situation that's developed within the, the republics of, the, of what was the Soviet Union. First of all, I guess we learned a lot about their equipment. One is their equipment is not as good as we thought it was. Two, their tactics, their tactics are not very good. They're very much direct from on high. And if you lose communications with your frontline troops, you don't, they don't give them much independence of action. And that's a weakness of the Iraqi tactic. We kind of knew that, but that was validated by what happened uh, here, here today. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, consequently, any, any nation that has been trained by the Russians or has Russian equipment 
we now can look at more skeptically than we had before as far as their capability is concerned. Uh, as far as the Russian military is concerned, the key question today, today, is where the military in the Soviet Union is going to go. And I just had a number of conversations with friends in Washington on that subject within the last two days. Uh, there's a lot of in, uh, intelligence work trying to determine that, as whether they're going to stay with Gorbachev in the center, which they have always been loyal to, or whether they're going to go with this new uh, commonwealth. My view is, my independent view is, because it's mixed feelings in the intelligence community, is they are going to go where there is legitimacy. And the legitimacy clearly seems to be moving in Yeltsin's direction and in this new commonwealth. So I think the military will fairly comfortably move in that direction because uh, Gorbachev has, and the center, has lost most political legitimacy. Yes, sir. I'd be interested to know your comments on the smart bomb that went into a bunker and it was so vivid on television. Yes. I've heard a lot of stories and I'd like to know what the real story was. And in a second question, what are your thoughts on the position of Israel ref with respect to the whole war? That was rather unusual. Yeah, two, qu uh, two questions. One relating to the smart bomb that went into the command bunker, which was very controversial because there were clearly a number of civilians in that bunker. And then the other question, uh, I'll get to the other question because I'll try to remember it in the meantime. Okay. Uh, the bunker was the one that upset me the most as far as our net coverage was concerned because that was clearly, in my judgment, a command bunker de designed to put command and control people in to, uh, to direct both air and ground forces. And there were, in fact, civilians within that command bunker, but it was a designed for a command bunker. It was camouflaged as a command bunker, and it had a perimeter fence around it, which in a, in a a civilian bomb shelter, you never put a perimeter fence around because you want to be able to get people in quickly when the siren goes off. And if the bunker gets hit, you want, or the bomb shelter gets hit, you want to be able to get as many out as you can. So I think it was clearly high level civilians and high level civilian families in that bunker, but it was a command bunker. Peter Arnett kept calling it a civilian bomb shelter, and I thought he was wrong on that, and he shouldn't have been wrong. He's seen a lot of wars and he's seen a lot of military. I wasn't so sure about the milk factory. That I'm not sure even today about that. But that command bunker is fairly clear. And I just talked to a vice president from CNN the other day who just came back from Baghdad and looked at that bunker. And he says, I agree with you, General, on your analysis of that. So, uh, and I've also got some indications in the Pentagon that I was essentially correct on my analysis that that was, in fact, a command bunker. I'm not absolutely sure because I haven't been there myself. But I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident about that. The second question related to, I'm sorry, Mike, Israel. I thought Israel acted responsibly in this war by not getting involved in it, even though there was a great temptation once the scuds started flying. They acted responsibly in the sense that if they had gone in, particularly in the early days of the war, it might have caused major damage to the coalition because there were a number of coalition partners that didn't want to fight on the side of Israel. As long as Israel was not fighting, then they could be comfortable in the coalition. So I thought they acted quite responsibly beyond what they uh, might have done in the past, and I think that's good. I think the fact that we put the Patriots in there quickly was a brilliant stroke to do that, to help protect them. And although it didn't completely protect them, it did gave them some protection. And so the Israelis came out, in my judgment, as a, a more responsible international actor on the world scene than they had been before. And I think that's good for Israel, and it's good for the Middle East because I think it can lead to better negotiations and better chances for peace in the future as a result of them not getting involved in the war. If they had gotten involved in the war actively, I don't think the peace process would have moved as, as far forward as it has over the course of the last, last few months.